It's my colleague from RT, Hugh Cahill, with Carl Pendred, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. There Thanks, Beth. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, you're very welcome. Carl, good to see you. Good to see you. Hello, Sorry everyone. Sorry not to shout too much. Um, how's the form? Good, yeah. Very yeah, good. I'm, I'm not surprised. Um, it's been some year for you, personally. It's been, it's been a massive year. Um, you know, I've been aiming, aiming to get where I am right now for a long time. Uh, it hasn't been easy. Um, there, there wasn't a path laid out there ahead of it, like myself and Connor. There was no one I had done it before, which some people thought made things impossible, but... You know, we, we ventured on and, and we've got to where we are now, which is great. Which is great. We'll talk about, I suppose, what, what's happened over the last year in a few minutes' time, but if you take it all the way back, I mean, you played rugby at school at Belvedere, and somewhere along the way you decided that MMA was for you. What made you decide that? Um, well, I first got interested in MMA while I was still in school playing rugby. Um, it, it captivated me in the sense that, you know, I discovered it was... It was martial arts, but it wasn't one single martial art. It was bringing all of them together. And um, I think that was something that really appealed to me. When I was a kid, I did lots of different martial arts, but I never found one in particular that uh, I, I, I really loved. So um, watch, watching the sport, I, I just got, got interested in it. I, I, didn't, um, I didn't know that there was any MMA going on in Ireland. And after leaving school, I moved to America. I was living in San Diego in California, and I came across the gym there. That, uh, that they did MMA. I went mm. in and, and after one class I was immediately hooked. So I came back from San Diego, I was playing under 20s rugby for Clontarf at the time. So, and then I found a gym in Dublin that was doing MMA. So I was doing the two in tandem. Uh, but I just gravitated towards the, the MMA side of things. It, everything I it had everything I loved about rugby, but in a more concentrated form. Like I loved, in rugby I was more about the the physicality of it. I, I, I wasn't as interested in getting the ball and making a run as I was uh, making tackles and hitting rooks. Rugby wasn't aggressive enough, aggressive enough for you, in other words. I, I wouldn't even say that. I just What appealed to me was just the physicality. And I, and I also loved one-on-one -on -one competition. I would always, when I had a big game coming up in, in rugby, I would always pick someone off the opposition team to, to outplay or just to target, to, to, to tackle and make a bad day of... Uh, I always loved that one-on-one -on -one competition, and, and that's, that's what MMA it, it really is. You know, it's, it's the purest comp form of competition in, in my eyes. I, I mean, because Des posed the question there, that it's not for everyone. I mean, not everyone. In fact, there's very few people who'd step into an octagon one-on-one -on -one with the aim of, of trying to hurt somebody uh, you know, or to win a fight. So this is either something that's it's in you or it's not. And obviously, you knew that you had it in you. Yeah, I, I definitely think... Like People often ask me when I have kids, would I... You know, encourage them to do martial arts, and I, I definitely, I, I encourage them to do martial arts, but I'd never c encourage them to compete or become a fighter. I think that's something you choose to do. It's either in you or it's not, and mm. it was, it was definitely it was in me, and um, you know, that's that's what that's what pulled me towards it. But like I said, it's I believe MMA or mixed martial arts is the purest form of competition. Humans compete because it's instinctual to survive. We. You know, we, we've only lived in, in, in the civilization we know for a few thousand years. We've uh, lived as, uh, as cavemen, I suppose, for yeah. millions of years. And, and to survive, we competed. And we didn't compete playing sport, or, uh, as we know it, like football, rugby. Uh, we competed through combat. So sport has, has derived from the competition that's instinctually in us, but it was really combat that, that came from there. Now, obviously, I mean, MMA, and particularly the UFC, has exploded here in the last couple of years. But... Not everyone enjoys it. Not everyone agrees with it. I mean, there are people who think that it's it's over the top, it's barbaric. Does that annoy you? Does it frustrate you? It really does, because anyone that ever takes a knock at MMA is always looking on the outside and doesn't fully understand it. They don't they don't understand that this this sport is one of the most technical sports in the world. If you compare MMA athletes to some other athletes, we train so much more um, because because of the diversity of sport. It's exactly what it says in the tin. It's mixed martial arts. We have to train multiple disciplines in martial arts. I have to train kickboxing, judo, boxing, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, uh, taekwondo, karate. I have, to, I have to train these all individually and then put them together. And on top of that, I have to do strength and conditioning and stuff. So it really is a, you know, a technical sport and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff involved. On top of that, it has one of the best safety records of all sports. It's, it's a young sport. 
It, it hasn't been around that long. The UFC, which would be the top organization in the world of MMA, is uh, just over 20 years old. But if you were to look at the UFC and look through its safety record, the biggest injury that has ever occurred in the UFC has been a leg break, and that mm. has happened twice in the UFC. Yeah. You look at rugby, and you look at over the course of a year, there's much more serious injuries that happen per annum um, compared to the 20-year history of the UFC. And it doesn't get the, the stick that MMA might. And that's just purely because it's new. People are unsure of it, and then sometimes people, you know, they'll attack something, but they don't, they don't fully understand what it is. Maybe the, the term cage fighting does it a disservice then, because cage fighting implies two lunatics into a cage and just see what happens. That's not what happens in the UFC. Exactly. That's uh, I'm, you know, I've been part of the the sport becoming mainstream. I think I've, I've grown up in the sport as it became mainstream, and that was one thing I was always against was was calling the sport cage fighting. It's mixed martial arts, and I think the ca cage fighting um, name just you know it it, it uh, gives off a bad impression. Mixed mm. martial arts tells you it tells you what the sport is. It, 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 do, it takes place in an octagon, which looks like a cage, and the reason being is because of the wrestling and the clinch work that's involved. The sport couldn't take place in a, in a boxing ring, which people have tried to do because of the wrestling. It could fall out through the ropes, etc. Yep. So it has this fenced-in area. It has nothing to do with the, you know, Trump lo <laughs> lock, the locking cage. two guys into a cage. <laughs> well, I wouldn't get in the cage with it. Anyway... Uh, <laughs> Let's take you back before, I mean, look, you've, you've just said you've, you've been doing this for quite a while now, and before Dublin, and before that incredible night in the O2 Arena, what's now the 3 Arena, things were pretty tough for you for a long time. Yeah, it, it, it's something that came to it uh, as a shock to people, and, uh, cause, because I, I never had mentioned it bef you know, before my UFC fight, that I had been struggling financially, but because you know, I had a bit of a name for myself, people knew I was one of the best in 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 Ireland uh, and Europe, and, and they just assumed that you know with that success came came money. But uh, I mean, you were a Cage Warriors champion. I mean, yeah, which essentially ma makes me the I was the number one guy in Europe. Yeah. But so people would assume that you know that I, I could make a living from from that, but that certainly wasn't the case. And uh, it, that's what makes this sport different than others is that you know you can, you can you you really I can only make a living in this sport when you get to the top, which is the UFC. It's like the the Champions League or the World Cup of, of MMA. Uh, until then, you're, you're supporting yourself, whereas you compare it to you know, football players or rugby players, they're nurtured when they show talent as, as young, young kids at 12, 13, and, and they're nurtured up through the ranks and they're looked after and, uh, and um, you know, a path is laid out in front of them. It's much more different for uh, um, MMA fighters. We have to, you know, we have to support ourselves, we have to find our own path and, yeah. and, and look after ourselves. And like I said, you don't make any money until you get to the very, very top. I'm in the UFC, which is, you know, it employs the top one percentile of, of athletes in my, in my uh, craft. And, um, you know, it's very hard to get there, but that's the, that's the one, that's the only place you can make money in, in this game. So, I mean, to do all that training, to have, to have had the discipline that you had to have to compete at that level, and to continually do that while also having this weight on top of your shoulders and worrying about about money, about you know being able to pay rent and, and simple things like that, that must have been very difficult. Did you question whether or not you could keep going and doing what you were doing? Yeah, you know, doubts pop into your head every now and again, but you know, I would immediately have to squash them. The, the main reason I've got to where I am is because I believed I, I, I could. Uh, I wouldn't have trained as hard, I wouldn't have thrown the kitchen sink at this if I didn't believe I would get to this point. It was very difficult, you know, I went, Especially the, the last few months before my UFC debut, um, you know that was. How bad are we talking? I was like three months behind in rent. I was uh, owed a couple of thousand euro on my electricity bill. I was, uh, like I often say, I was actually coming home from training, driving home and praying that I'd be able to turn my electricity on. I'd have lights and be able to charge my phone. So that's how bad it was. And um, but I didn't even I I didn't talk about it. I didn't even tell my family about it because. The reason being was because it was it was my choice. Like there's people that can't pay their bills, and you know they don't have a choice. No matter. I, I have a degree. I, I graduated in 2012. I I could have uh, you know have a science degree. I could have got a, a a job in a pharmaceutical company, one of the industries that wasn't hit really in the recession. Uh, but I decided to pursue my pa passion for my own, you know, personal selfish reasons, I suppose. So it was my choice. So I didn't I didn't go on about it. I didn't make a a meal about it. And I only really mentioned it then after. You know, after it kind of 
yeah. had gone away. Another reason I didn't mention it was because I didn't want it to be in a, a, a point of conversation with people because uh, I'm a believer in positivity and uh, that was something I just didn't want to be talking about. You yeah. know? I just wanted to get on with the most important thing, which was training hard. Okay, so then, I mean, Conor McGregor gets a, a couple of shots and all of a sudden this show comes to town, your hometown, you're on the bill and you fight a guy called Mike King after being through the Ultimate Fighter with him in the house. He's somebody you knew very well. Yeah, I, I, did, um, I did the Ultimate Fighter show for the UFC, which is a reality-based show, um, which is, which is um, filmed in Vegas, and we live in a house together. Um, so how many guys living in a house together? Six, 16. 16. 16 fighters put in a house together. MMA fighters in a house together. Uh, with no contact with the outside world, cameras in your face 24-7. That was fun, wasn't it? It was, the mo it was the most horrible thing I've, I've done in my life. <laughs> Never mind not being able to pay a rent or anything. This was just the most <laughs> uncomfortable, awful thing ever. But, uh, it makes you appreciate everything in life, so I'm glad I did it. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you, there was a lot of guys I didn't get on with in the house, but there was a few guys I did get on with. And one of the guys I actually did really get on well with was this guy, Mike King. And uh, we, we hit it off. And uh, I didn't, we did our six weeks on the show, and then we came home. I didn't keep in contact with too many of the people off the show, but he was one of the guys we, we kept in good contact with. I remember we were t he, like, he lived in Florida. We were talking about I would maybe you know, go on holiday with my girlfriend and would stay with him and his girlfriend, this mm. sort of thing. And then it was announced that the UFC wanted the pair of us to fight in, in UFC. How did you feel about that? Um, it was, it was a bit weird. It was a coincidence. Yeah, that, you know. it, it was a bit weird. Um, I had an idea that it might happen because we were both seeing... Uh, we, you know, uh, as two prospects in, in on the show, and I, I thought it might happen. It was a bit weird, and I was put into a scenario I I never was put in before. But you know, at the end of the day, this is our job. This is what we are paid to do. And uh, look, we when the fight was an, announced, we actually well, con he contacted me first and asked how they, he said, "Have you heard from the OC?" And I said, "Yeah, I know what you're talking about. We heard him. We kind of we we nearly said a goodbye. This was about three months before the fight. I said, "Look, listen." You go train hard, um, do your thing. I'm gonna do the same, and we'll we'll talk on the 19th of July, and we'll have a beer afterwards. And that was the last we spoke for the three months of training up to the up to the fight on the 19th of July. So that bill is confirmed, obviously, and um, it's sold out in in a matter of hours. I think um, 8,000 tickets. And you're training for that. Do you realise at that stage? Do you know? Are you saying to yourself in your head, "This is my chance. This is my shot. I have to take this." Yeah, um, a hundred percent. I knew that was the case, but to be honest with you, it's, it was nothing new to me because it's always the the case in MMA. Like I said, I was the number one guy in Europe, and every mm. fight I said, right, this is the one. Now I put in a good performance here, get rid of this guy early, and I'm going to get signed by the UFC. And it's such a cutthroat sport in in business, in in that sense, because you know, a win in this game takes you one step forward, but a loss takes you two steps back. So I knew it was a big big fight for me. I knew. Uh, you know, it would really propel me further in my career, but uh, it, it was a scenario I was used to, even though uh, it was my first one in the UFC. Would it be fair to say the, the fight didn't start quite as you might have envisaged? It could, it possibly started the worst way I could have <laughs> imagined. <laughs> you just I, tell people what happened. So I came out, um, I, f I just felt a bit stiff and nimble. I didn't get off, uh, get a good start, and next of all, I got hit with a big punch. Mike was a big guy, hit me with a punch with a on the chain, wobbled me, uh, kind of did a little chicken dance and then <laughs> landed on the floor. And then Mike pounced on top of me, um, was throwing a few more shots and I was in a really bad position. Uh, the referee was telling me to defend myself or he was going to stop the fight, which is, you know, the case in MMA. The, the referee's sole purpose in the, in the, in the game is to, to make sure that no one gets seriously hurt. So he, w he was about to stop it because I was in at a point where I was about to get hurt. And I managed to break free and then Mike got me into a, a submission hold uh, where he, he took my back and he, he had me in what people would, would know as a sleeper hold. And it was pretty much locked in and then I somehow managed to, to wriggle free and get out. And, and that was basically... Watching back, do you really... I mean, watching you do it at the time was just incredible. The whole place went mental, but uh, did you, can you even remember how you felt at that particular stage? Yeah, I, I can remember the whole thing. Um, and I remember just... Every time I was, I went from one bad position to another, and I just remember every time just saying, uh, just talking to myself in my head, saying, "You can get out of this. You can get, just get back to a better position. That's all you need to do." 
and I just just kept encouraging myself to do that. And then at no point did I say to myself, "Ah, oh, you're done here," because and I know if I had done that, that it would have been over. Had had he been on top of me throwing shots, and I said, "Oh, that's me done," I would have stopped moving. The referee would have seen, oh, right, this guy's about to get hurt, and he would have stopped it. But I just kept telling myself, I, I, you know, I can turn this around and get back to your feet and get going again. And uh, that's all I can remember from the first round. Then I got back to my corner. And I remember thinking to myself, i got to start afresh. It couldn't, have, it couldn't have gone worse for the first round. But i just got to act like that didn't happen and, and start the fight all over. He gave it. you everything he had, though, and you were still standing. So that must have been a huge psychological boost for you. He did, and it's not. It's actually not the first time that that's happened where someone has thrown the kitchen sink at me, and I'm still there in front of him. And I think sometimes that's the most, uh, you know, daunting thing to it, to uh, to a mixed martial artist is when they have given everything to put a guy away, and he's still standing there in front of you, yeah. and they're thinking to themselves, "Well, oh, what do I, I can't, can't beat I can't, this guy. I can't beat this guy. There's nothing I can do to get rid of this guy." So you know, I probably played on him after the first round, and gone. I don't think I can get rid of this guy. Yeah, and you could see you could see that he came out for the next round, and he was he was tired because he he spent so much energy trying to take you down, and he he just couldn't do it. And then you go and you win the fight, mm -hmm. and the whole place goes crazy. It was it was it's the most insane thing I've ever experienced in my life. I think it was somewhere. I keep hearing different figures. I'm not sure the exact amount of people in the O2 that night, but it was somewhere around the ten thousand mark. But it sounded like thirty, forty thousand people in there. And it was absolutely insane. The, the UFC recorded, uh, they had a decimal meter recording the sound, and they said it was the loudest ever UFC they've had. And they've had events where there was 40,000 people there. So the 10,000 Irish fans that were there made more noise than other you know, I mean, I've been at a few, uh, I mean, Bernard Dunn's European fight, his, his world championship fight, all incredible. But I just couldn't get over the, the noise and the atmosphere. It just felt like the roof was going to come clean off at one stage. Yeah, it was crazy. And then the feedback I was getting, the, you know, just the few days after, the week after, people coming up to me. Nearly every person I spoke to had a, had no voice or had a hoarse voice <laughs> just because they were literally screaming from the first fight, I think, was at about half six and it finished at about half ten. And they were literally screaming for those four hours. And uh, I think the, one of the biggest things to me, for me was uh, you know, a friend of mine, Keane Healy, who most of you know from playing rugby for Ireland, he, he said it was the best sporting event he's ever been at. And this is a guy who's won Heineken Cups and Six, six Nations, Nations and yeah. stuff. So like to, to hear that from him was... Well, it was pretty amazing. So um, you came back from nothing. I mean, there was a couple of things I was thinking about as well. You know, but for you coming out of the Ultimate Fighter earlier than you wanted to, in terms of not winning it, which had been your plan, and but for the referee having the experience that he had in that first round against Mike King, not to stop that fight, things could have taken a very different road for you. Definitely, yeah. The stars really aligned for me, you know, to to to, to just really enter the UFC exactly the, in the best possible way. Had a I came. I had a controversial loss on the Ultimate Fighter in the semi-finals. Um, I lost to the eventual winner. But had I had I won that fight, I would have fought the week before UFC Dublin and missed out on that. Yeah. You know, missed out on making my debut in my hometown. Um, you know, so I, I'm I'm glad the way it went. And then, like you said, had the referee stopped it, which was very close in the first round of that fight. Um, you know, that could have been the end of my UFC career. Um, I, I would have been on the on the end end of a, a pretty one-sided loss so thankfully i had one of the best referees in the game mark goddard there who you know he could see i was still in the in the fight at all times i was still trying to to get back and at no point had i given up so i'm very grateful for that after the fight um dana white pretty impressed with you yeah that's you know people talk about the crowd and how surreal that was but the, i think the most surreal thing the thing that really hit home for, with me was afterwards you know, I walked out of the octagon. I, I saw my family went over and embraced my family. And they, you know, they obviously knew how much that, the whole thing meant to me. And I walked backstage. Everyone was was trying to grab me and get a hold of me. It was just, it was all very surreal. But then I got backstage, and Dana White, who who is the president of the UFC, literally came, came running down towards me. And you know, I kind of just stood st stood there in shock. And he ca he came running, and then he got to me, and he just started jumping up and down and grabbing me and screaming. He was like, "That's the most incredible thing I've ever seen in my life. That's the most incredible comeback ever." Mm. And uh, you now I know, like, this is the guy who runs the UFC. If you, uh, if you, this is you know, I'm, I'm an employee of the UFC. If you want to impress someone in in your job, that's the guy to be impressing. He's sure. the guy at the top. So, you know, so I, n I knew at that point not only had I won my my UFC debut, but I've, I I had changed my life. Well, look, we're just out of time, uh, unfortunately. You went on, obviously, your next fight, you beat the Russian, um, a real grueling battle, but you got through it. 
and you're in a situation now where you're two from two, you're undefeated in the UFC, not too many fighters can say that, and you have the possibility of a fight, hopefully, maybe in, in the new year. Yeah, uh, I'm looking to, looking to go 3 and 0 very soon. Um, you know, there's a there's a fight uh, announcement coming pretty soon. I can't say anything yet, but yeah. it's going to be a big one, and it's going to be. Uh, I think we can all have a good guess, but I'd yeah. Say, yeah, I'd say people could probably guess, but yeah, well, I, I'll, I'll keep tight lipped about it until I can't yeah. say anything. Yeah, well, look, uh, it's it's been a pleasure talking to you, and uh, congratulations on everything so far, and best of luck with the future. Carl Pender, ladies Thanks. and gentlemen. Hang on, just before you go, you, who, who, what is the guess? What is what? What is the guess? <laughs> the <laughs> guess? Yeah, he says everyone can guess, you say everyone Oh, can uh, sorry, guess. the guess, yeah. well, I mean, if you think that um, maybe Conor McGregor is fighting in Boston in, in January, yeah. and uh, the fighting Irish over there, maybe, okay. maybe. I, I was born in Boston, just in an unrelated note. Oh, were you? I was, my, my parents uh, are Irish, but they were working over there at the, in 1987 when I was born, oh, and uh, so... I'm a, I'm a I was there in '87. Were you? Yeah. Uh, well, you were just. Uh, <laughs> there's no resemblance <laughs> about us. I'm from the hairy cows. <laughs> Carl, love you. Wow. Best of luck well, with your you. career <laughs> going forward. <laughs>